Today on Team and IT Gems, we're joined by Scott Charkoff, who is the Director of the Strategic Threat Advisory Group for Asia Pacific and Japan and EMEA at CrowdStrike. Scott joins us today to discuss the current trends in the cyber threat landscape and the work CrowdStrike is doing to prevent further cyber harm. Thanks for joining us today, Scott, and welcome to the Jam. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to, I don't know, you know, talking about what we're seeing. Absolutely. So um, just to start off, um, well, broadly speaking, we have three actors that have um, continued to kind of elevate their um, tradecraft. Um, what trends are you seeing in the current cyber threat landscape? I mean, we're seeing quite a few trends, actually. Um, if you take a look at the global threat report that we published earlier this year, you can kind of get a you know hint as to the majority of those trends. A lot of those are around ransomware. I think we've seen, you know, about an 82% increase in leaks associated with ransomware. We're starting to see, uh, like, the idea of, of extortion without necessarily deploying ransomware as another kind of emerging trend. I think we've seen this with who we track as, as Slippy Spider, but I think the, you know, the broader world knows them as the Lapsus Group. So, you know, I think that's a trend that we've... That we're at least keeping an eye on. We're seeing it with a with a few different groups. So some something to kind of keep in mind. Also, another trend that we saw that's you know very clearly kind of outlined in the global threat report is the increase in the use of malware-free techniques. Right. So kind of in 2020, I think it was a 51 percent uh, use of malware-free versus malware. First time that it was above 50 uh, 50 percent, and then last year that climbed from that 51 up to 62 percent. So that's another trend uh, that we're seeing, you know, with uh, with a lot of the, and actually the vast majority of the detections being malware free, uh, primarily, uh, you know, kind of living off the land techniques, you know, using native operating system binaries, things of that nature. I think uh, the other thing that we're seeing is a few other areas. So I'll hit on kind of some nation state trends. I guess what I've talked about so far is primarily focused on the e-crime side. On the nation state side, we've seen things like the adversaries based out of China often focusing on vulnerability exploitation. I think there is the, the number is, uh, I think it's a 600% increase year over year in the number of new vulnerabilities that the pandas targeted uh, between 2020 and 2021. So that's a, that's a big trend, you know, focusing on those newer vulner vulnerabilities, knowing that there's probably, you know, a much greater chance that they're, that, that they're still unpatched because they're, they're new, right? So there's that trend. And then probably another broad trend from the nation state side is the use of the use or the focus on trying to exploit the cloud, right? You know, I think we're all moving to the cloud. The, the whole kind of idea of work from home is more or less forced a lot of organizations' hands to focus on cloud-based services. And so that's just a natural evolution for the adversaries to go after those cloud-based environments to see what they can do to try and, uh, you know, try and use that to their, to their advantage. And uh, I think that's probably a, you know, a big area that we're, that we're focusing on. I think, you know, uh, the lemon duck botnet is probably one of the areas where we see quite a bit of activity uh, but you know, there's there's a whole host of, of activity, and probably the last thing that I'll I'll hit on before I before I kind of end with the uh, with you know the major trends is the idea of access brokers. I mean, we've seen access brokers rise across 2020, but in 2021 and thus far the first you know kind of six months of 2022, access brokers have become a you know a main component of pretty much any e-crime based attack, often seeing, you know, adversaries actually going into the criminal underground, purchasing credentials that have already been harvested by some other adversary or some other criminal, and then leveraging those for initial access, you know. Why worry about, you know, exploiting a vulnerability when you can just, you know, be handed the keys to the kingdom? It makes life so much easier. Absolutely. Yeah, lots of changes um, occurring at the moment. Um, in terms of, you mentioned Lemon Duck a little bit. Can you uh, tell us a bit more about why that's dangerous and um, what an impact that has on organizations? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, if uh, folks out there don't know what Lemon Duck is, I guess let me start with that. So Lemon Duck is a crypto mining botnet that basically is targeting Docker containers. And the goal really is to mine cryptocurrency across Linux systems. 
it drops, I think, what's called the XM Rig Monero uh, CPU Coin Miner. And, you know, that basically then turns that machine into, uh, you know, part of that botnet for, for mining, you know, different cryptocurrencies in particular, you're kind of focusing on the Monero side of the house. So one of the reasons that it's dangerous is because it's, you know, exploiting misconfigurations in publicly facing Docker containers, right? And that does, I mean, that, that in and of itself, the fact that there's misconfigured containers is a huge issue, right? I mean, that's something that I think, you know, IT professionals, security professionals in particular need to be very cognizant of is it's kind of a, you know, new world, right? We're kind of, I don't want to say we're like back to square one because we're absolutely not. We're still well ahead today where we were when we started building, you know, these huge data centers. But nevertheless, like the move to the cloud is, is, is fraught with some, uh, you know, some, some areas where people need a bit more uh, focus and understanding on on the potential vulnerabilities of not configuring properly, and that's an area where like Lemon Duck is excelling is in focusing on that. Also, something else that it's really good at doing is evading the uh, the detection, in particular, like in Alibaba's cloud monitoring service. It's able to disable it and then essentially kind of operate more or less, you know, uh, undetected and kind of do do what it needs to do. Also, it's known for targeting exchange servers in particular, and I think we're all familiar with the proxy logon vulnerabilities from, I guess, uh, around this time last year, maybe it was a little earlier this time last year. So, you know, it's exploiting the proxy logon vulnerabilities, uh, Bluekeep as well, and then it's using the well-known Eternal Blue exploit for... Uh, you know, for kind of for propagation and, and whatnot. So for those that aren't familiar with that term, I'm sure at this point, you know, it's been quite some time since Eternal Blue is unveiled to the world, but for those that don't remember, you know, that's the, the weaponized exploit that was part of the WannaCry ransomware, uh, you know, attack that occurred. I don't know, what year was that? 2017? Is that when that was? Something like that. Brain's a little fuzzy on the on the timing. But yeah, I mean, everyone's heard of WannaCry. So that's, that's another thing. Um... And one of the other areas in particular with, you know, the Docker component is not just the misconfiguration of the containers, but, you know, Docker does have a number of, of publicly available API endpoints. And that's something else that, that Lemon Duck is focused on, on hitting is, you know, those, those API endpoints that, you know, many developers are leveraging. That's one of the, you know, nice things about Docker is, you know, a bit of automation and those API endpoints can, can help but they can also harm. And in this case, that's, you know, the, you know, one of the major, the, I guess one of the major vulnerabilities is the fact that those, the, those containers are misconfigured, the API endpoints can then be exploited. And then this allows a whole host of things such as, you know, the ability to move lateral across an existing uh, set of containers, the ability to escalate privileges, the ability to break out of the container and a whole host of, you know, really dangerous things that can lead to really bad stuff, quote unquote, trademark, I don't know. Yeah, all kinds of bad things going on. Yeah, for sure. And um, you say APIs are pretty high on the hit list for um, threat actors. Um, how else have you observed um, uh, threat actors exploiting these to infect harm? Uh, I mean, so that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I'm not going to say that there's like, you know, uh, it, it's like a go-to, like, say, ransomware, right? You know, it, ransomware is pervasive. It's everywhere. We're reading about ransomware every day. We're not necessarily reading about API hits every day, but I think as adversaries recognize that things like Docker containers are misconfigured and are easily exploitable, and, and in particular those API endpoints, we're going to start to see, you know, a bit more of that. Um I think earlier this year we we identified I think it was like somewhere between February and March there were some threat actors that were exploiting some some Docker engine honeypots to kind of execute some pro Ukrainian denial of service attacks kind of you know basically around the you know the conflict between between Russia and Ukraine and then uh, the denial of service attacks were targeting Russian and Belarusian government, military, and civilian targets. So this is interesting because normally honeypots are designed to lure attackers and for the attackers to do a bunch of things. And then you can learn, you know, attacker, 
uh, you know, tradecraft through the honeypot. In this case, the honeypots were actually used by the adversaries. They were compromised via, uh, once again, a Docker expose, a Docker engine API exposure, and used that for, you know, for malicious purposes. Something that I just actually read this morning, actually, was the, I don't know how many folks are familiar with, uh, the uh, the Badger decentralized autonomous organization. It's a decentralized finance platform for cryptocurrency, uh, for borrowing and lending. And there was an attack that occurred that resulted in I think 120 million dollars of users' funds that were that were stolen. And in this case, the attacker executed this attack by generating an unauthorized API key for Badger's Cloudflare workers account. And that allowed the attacker to inject some malicious JavaScript into the web page. They used that JavaScript code to fool Badger users into permitting the withdrawal of funds into the adversary's wallet. So once again, here's another example of API utilization that allowed kind of some access into the into the environment which then resulted in you know a huge amount of money being stolen from from users so you know those are just some of the examples uh, where you know we're seeing api endpoints being uh, you know being exploited and i you know i kind of would suspect once again kind of like with you know the focus on the cloud that as adversaries recognize that other adversaries are being successful with the exploitation of API endpoints that they'll start to you know kind of gravitate towards that just because that's what the that that's what adversaries do and like you know they'll focus on what what works and then use that to their advantage you know and so that's one of the reasons why ransomware is so you know, so pervasive because it works. And so I suspect we'll probably start to see the same thing with API endpoints. Absolutely, yeah, lots of trial and error. Um, in terms of the um, threat actors that exploit organizations after they've gained initial access, how common is this and, and how are you seeing this in practice? Well, I mean, that's that's the whole point, right? Like you, you get initial access and because, you know, you, that's what you need, right? You need to open the front door. Uh, well, it doesn't have to be the front door. I guess it could be the, it could be the back door. It could be the side door, you know, whatever you could become, I guess you could be like Santa Claus and come through the chimney too. But you know, the end of the day is the goal is to get inside the house, right? And that's where all the crown jewels are at. And, you know, you want to, you want to get inside the house and find the safe that has all the I don't know, all the money that, uh, you know, that you're storing there or all those important documents or whatever the case may be. So post-exploitation activities is, you know, the, the name of the game, right? And that's the critical issue is that organizations need to not just focus on initial access, but also focus on post-exploitation activity. So, you know, when we think about, say, for example, a ransomware attack, Yes, there is some initial access that occurs, whether it's through the access brokers that I mentioned earlier or through various other techniques like, you know, phishing, or spear phishing, etc. But then, you know, it starts to get into a situation where adversaries are maybe using tools like Cobalt Strike, those are commodity tools, or using some post-exploitation -exploit frameworks. I think uh, Ice Apple is one of those post-exploitation uh, frameworks that we've that we've seen some adversaries um, kind of focus on. It's uh, I think this is a modular framework that kind of focuses primarily on on Microsoft Exchange as well as. Uh, I think what is what does IS even stand for these days? It's been so long since I messed around with the Microsoft web server. I forgot what IS in, Internet Information Services is. That what it is? I think Microsoft IIS. Um, I know what Apache stands for. That's easy. But yeah, so I mean, you have like Ice I, Ice Apple, which is one framework. I think another one which I just read about is uh, is Ice Giant. It's a it's a memory resident .net exploit post exploitation framework this one is very specifically uh, focused on attacking uh, IIS web servers and uh, we've seen this in in use as well so like you know there's these exploitation frameworks post exploitation frameworks that you know like any framework just makes it very easy to continue to replicate the same behavior right an adversary that may not necessarily be skilled in developing their own tools they just grab 
you know, one of those existing frameworks out there and just use that because it's, you know, usually pretty easy, I guess. I'll put easy in air quotes, right? You know, it's much easier than trying to develop a post-exploitation framework or trying to develop a, you know, a scenario because you already got something that somebody's developed that's obviously being demonstrated as as having been effective and so these are just a couple of them so ice apple uh ice giant and then you know there's like i said also there's the uh there's the commodity tools that that we see you know often uh, being used i think with going just going back to ice apple for a moment um again it's post exploitation right so it's not for that initial access phase it's after the access has been has been granted, I guess, if you will. That's probably not the right word. Uh, gained is probably the better word here. And then the adversary will use this to achieve, you know, any a number of, of potential other object um, uh, objectives, right? So, you know, maybe we're talking about, you know, something that the adversary wants to do now. Maybe we're talking about, you know, a little bit more of a slow roll approach, like a, you know, advanced persistent threat actor. So, you know, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's weeks, months. Uh, down the line, and then uh, use this to to uh, you know achieve their ultimate uh, goals. I think our Overwatch teams conducted a number of investigations around Ice Apple uh, in particular, and I think there was like 18 different modules that were found uh, with functionality that ranges from like discovery to harvesting of credentials to d the deletion of you know parts of the file system, data exfiltration, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, post exploitation frameworks like Ice Apple can provide adversaries with once again you know, kind of a, you know, a, a broad array of tools that can allow them to do all kinds of, you know, once again, bad things. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's great to um, be able to know about those and, and further look for ways to prevent uh, harm in the future. Look, again, thanks so much for joining us today, Scott, and we really look forward to hearing more from CryoStrike in the future. And I know um, people will be eagerly looking at the uh, reports and uh, further examining them. No, thank you very much for having me. And uh, yeah, I look forward to chatting with anyone that's interested. And, in, you know, this is like a passion of mine. So anything that anyone wants to talk about, by all means, you know, reach out and let us know. Awesome. Thanks very much.